So hello and welcome everyone uh, to yet another uh, session on school synergy. Uh, I am Ruchi Kumar. I am assistant professor at uh, Center of uh, uh, Excellence in Teacher Education at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. And uh, I have been anchoring the School Synergy Workshop series for past three years. We have continued this series uh, during the pandemic. And uh, now also we are continuing the online mode of uh, sessions, as well as uh, we are having offline uh, sessions also at the center itself. Uh, we have announced these sessions at the School Synergy Teachers Forum on Telegram. And uh, I hope that all of you are part of the Syner School Synergy Teachers Forum also, because whatever we discuss in these uh, workshops, we continue the discussion on the Telegram itself. Um, the purpose of the School Synergy Workshop series was to bring uh, the two spaces of education together. One is the university where teacher education takes, uh, takes place and another is the school uh, space where the teachers are actually engaged in their classroom practices in, uh, you know, in supporting students learning. And we hope that this School Synergy Teachers Forum and workshop series will provide opportunity for teachers as well as, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah. teacher educators to connect with each other, to exchange ideas, to build on each other's knowledge. Now, uh, this, um, uh, this year's School Synergy Workshop series, this semester, we are focusing on a specific theme called, you know, learning from mistakes. And we believe that there is a great opportunity. Windows, uh, you know, uh, mistakes are a windows to students' uh, thinking, and they can even be great opportunity for us to support students' learning. And within these themes, we have organized several workshops in the past, and we continue to do that till December. In this um, uh, workshop series itself, we today present um, Daya Chatani. Uh, from uh, Gateway School. She has been a coordinator of a social emotional group in the Gateway itself. And she is also uh, worked, uh, is an expert in autism and behavioral uh, sciences. And we look forward to hearing from her also because Gateway is one of our partner schools uh, in which our uh, students who are doing B.E. at Emmet, they are get, uh, doing internship at Gateway. And they are learning a lot about, you know, how inclusive practices can be adopted in the classroom. So uh, let me invite Daya Chatani and Zeba Contractor, both from Gateway School, to take you on this uh, journey. And the topic of the sessions, uh, today's session is Mindset for Learning. Over to you, Daya Chatani. Thank you so much, Ruchi. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're all having a good day. Um, I'm Daya, uh, like Ruchi said, and Zeba is here with me. Zeba, do you just want to weave out so everyone can see you? Hi, everyone. Okay, so we'll be taking you through um, today's presentation. Um, it's called Mindset for Learning. So we'll be talking um, about growth mindset and a fixed mindset and how, um, you know, that impacts um, our thoughts around mistakes, challenges, putting in effort, just like Ruchi said around uh, that, that topic. Um, Zepa, do you want to move to the next slide? So we have a few expectations for today, just to make sure that everyone gets the most out of the session. Um, I'm going to request, if you can, please do put your video on. Um, the reason I ask for this is so that um, I can see you and you can see me and we can engage with one another. It'll just make the engagement much better and the session much more fruitful. So if possible, please do switch on um, your videos. Uh, also, when um, someone is speaking, please do keep your mic on mute so that we can hear them. But when you are talking, of course, please do unmute yourself so that we can hear you. If you have any questions at any point, um, you can raise a virtual hand and Zeba will point it out um, to me. If you have any questions as well, you can put them in the chat box. Zeba is monitoring that. Um, thank you so much, Bhavna, for putting on your video. Thank you so much. Um, okay, only Bhavna. So thank you so much, Bhavna, for putting on your video. It's lovely to see you today. Um, for this session, you'll need a piece of paper and a pencil. So if you'd want to quickly go and grab that, we'll put on a timer. And once everyone's back from doing that, if you could just put a thumbs up, then I'll know you're ready to go. 
Thank you. So if you've got your paper and pencil, you can just show a virtual thumbs up um, and then I'll know you're ready. Thank you, Anju. Thank you, Aruna. Uh, I think we'll start then. Okay, so um, our learning objectives for today, we have three learning objectives. Um, we'd like to take you through the why, the what, and the how. So when we talk about the why, we want to explore the science of learning. So that's the brain and neuroplasticity. We then want to talk about the what. So we want to explore mindset for learning and that's growth mindset. And finally, we'll take you through the how. So we want to learn how we can build this mindset for learning um, in our students or in our community, for example. So the first question we want to ask ourselves, do you think people are born smart? Are they born talented? Or do we think that talent and skill is something that can be nurtured? Is it something that can be taught? So if you'd like to put your answers in the um, chat box or if you think talent is something we're born with, um, you can do that right now. So if you think we're born with it, yes or no, you can put that in. Thank you, Abhijit, for your answer. You said it's nurtured. Anyone else has any thoughts? So Anju says, yes, people are born smart, they're born talented. Partner says it's something that's nurtured. Any other responses? So we'll move on and we'll find out if talent is something that's born and innate or it's something that's nurtured. Um, so Zeba, would you like to move to the next slide? Okay, so let's look at some examples to help us. Einstein's teachers said that he was academically subnormal but he actually became one of the most influential physicists of the 20th century. So this tells us that talent is not something that we're entirely born with. We can nurture it also because he was born academically subnormal, but he ended up becoming one of the greatest physicists of our time. So definitely it's something that we nurture over time. We also have another example for you. Marilyn Monroe was told that because of her stutter, she would never act, but she actually would be the world That again tells us that if you put in the effort, you put in the time, you can actually reach where you need to go. So it's not only about talent being um, innate or being born, but it's definitely something that we can nurture over time. We now have a video we'd like to show you. Um, Zeba, do you want to go ahead and do that? This important period of... A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. 
Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Okay, so when we are born, there are neurons and some connections in our brain. And the more experiences we have... This, this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells... Uh, so when we are born, there are neurons and some connections in our brain. And the more experiences we have, the more we practice, the stronger these connections get and more pathways are formed. I'm now going to take you through something called neuroplasticity. Um, Zepa, do you mind stopping your... Yeah, so that I can share mine. Thank you. So there'll be three questions um, and I'll stop the video when the questions come and hopefully you can all share your answers with me when the questions pop up on the screen. Not so long ago, many scientists believe that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. Its neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. Okay, so brain science tells us that the brain has the ability to grow and change. But is this only at birth, throughout our lives, or only until our teenage years? What does everyone think? Any thoughts? I can put it back. Yeah, you can unmute and uh, speak also if you want. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you have Bhavna, Justine, Anju said throughout our lives. Okay. Rita has said up to teenage. Okay. Then we have a few others who said, uh, Aruna has said uh, throughout our life. Pramila and Prapti have also said throughout our lives. Okay, so I think the consensus is moving throughout um, our lives. So let's check that one and see. So definitely, it is throughout our lives. Um, we can form these connections for as long as possible. As long as you keep trying new things, you keep making mistakes, you keep challenging yourself, your brain is going to continue to change. Connections are going to continue to form. So this doesn't stop at any point. It happens throughout your life. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel, or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task, or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road. So neural pathways are strengthened. That means we become more skilled or proficient when we put effort into practicing or we're genetically gifted. Any thoughts, ideas on this? You can also unmute like Ruchi said and share. You don't necessarily have to share in the chat box. Thank you, Anju. Anju says practices. Yeah, it is through practices only. Lovely. Any, anyone else with any other thoughts? Abhijit also says through practice. Through practice? Okay, so let's try that and see. So neural pathways are strengthened when we put effort into practicing. So like we said, throughout your life, you can learn new things so that new connections are formed and these connections will become stronger as you practice them. It becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Think about something differently. Learn a new task or choose a different emotion. We start carving out a new road. If we keep traveling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more 
and this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. So new neural pathways are formed, that means new learning takes place when we repeat the same thing again and again by sleeping only through genetics at birth or through new experiences and challenges. This one's a little tricky. Then I think we have some responses in the chat. Have Rita say through new experience and challenges. Anju says A and D, option A and B. Okay. Pramila says through new experiences and challenges as well. Okay, so let's find out. So the right answer is through new experiences and challenges because your brain will form new connections when you try new and different things. And as you keep doing them, those connections get strengthened. So each time you try something new, a new connection is formed. But when you keep practicing that, that strengthens that connection. So that's why the answer is D and not E. Okay, I'm All right. So, Shabba, should we continue? I will stop sharing. I'm sorry, Zeb, I can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry. So, while we said that neuroplasticity says that our brain can develop throughout our life, Aruna shared that some skills like language need to start developing early because it's a, um, it's a critical uh, period in our life. That's a very valid point. Yeah. That's a lettuce. I'm sorry, can we all stay on mute? So yeah, yeah, we... I'll just mute them. Just don't okay. worry. Yeah. Thank you, Richie. Sorry. Please go ahead. Sometimes people unmute by mistake. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to look at a research study that highlights this idea of neuroplasticity a little more. So the fact that our brain is like a muscle and it can grow. And that is when we use it a lot. So this research study was done with London taxi cab drivers. And then in order for you to become a taxi driver, you have to pass this test called the knowledge. And typically it takes two to four years for someone to prepare for and pass the test because it requires drivers to know about 25,000 streets and 22,000 landmarks that exist in the city of London. And researchers studied the brains of people who successfully passed the test and became taxi drivers and those who studied for it, but either did not pass the test or dropped out. So scientists found that after this complex spatial training, because you have to know when you have to remember the streets, you have to know which one goes one way, which one goes one way at which time. And what they saw was that the hippocampus got physically bigger for those people who studied for the test and actually passed it. And the hippocampus is a part of the brain that specializes in acquiring and using complex spatial information. This is so fascinating because it shows us that for those people who are using this part of their brain regularly and were strengthening those pathways, it led to the physical anatomy of the brain actually changing. And then the researchers studied these same taxi drivers when they retired. So what they found was that the hippocampus actually shrank back down when they stopped using that part of their brain regularly. So this study actually highlights that through practice, we truly can change what our brain can do. Um, we'll now take a 
a round of questions because we finished going through um, the why behind everything. So if you have any questions up until this point, before we move into the what, which is the mindset of learning and how to translate it in the classroom, if you have any questions, we'll take that now and then we'll do a quick eye break before we continue. Um, so if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box or you can unmute and ask them also. Sorry, is my voice better now? I tried to make it louder. I, I, I hope it's better for you now, Rita. Rita saying yes. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Good to meet you. Um, any questions? No? Makes sense to everybody so far? Uh, should we take a one minute eye break? Yes, we'll do the one minute eye break. Oh, we have a question. Um, Abhijit is asking that, ma'am, genetics don't play any role in development of the brain. So, um, Abhijit, as we'll be sharing as we go further in, um, the genetics definitely does play a role. But what we're trying to say is that it's not the only factor. So, it's one factor. Of course, you're born with. Um, you know, certain talents, certain traits, but what you do with that will impact what actually becomes, uh, what the outcome is. So today, if I'm born, um, you know, with a certain level of intelligence and I don't put any practice, or I don't put any effort into it, I'm not going to get very far. So it's a combination of the two, your genetics and how you use that genetic makeup. Both come together to lead to the final product. But we will be sharing more examples as we go ahead to help highlight this a little bit better. Okay, so Abhijit is saying because when it comes to China, just as an instance, people try their best to manipulate DNA, right? So again, like I said, it's definitely a combination. Um, today, you know, you could be born with certain talents, but if you don't ever practice those talents, um, you're not going to get very far. But we will show you more concrete examples um, as we go ahead. I don't want to take away from the presentation by by showing it right now but we'll definitely um highlight this and at that point if your question is still not answered please do come back to it and you can call me daya thank you any other question no okay um so we'll take a quick eye break um, what we can all do, because we've been looking at the screen for quite some time and we don't want our eyes to get too tired. So you can all rub your palms together. You can do this. And then you can use your palms to cover your eyes for five seconds. I hope everybody's eyes are rested and ready to go. All right, so like I shared, we've spoken about the why. So we explored the science of learning, the brain, and neuroplasticity. Now we're going to talk about the what, which is a mindset for learning, that is growth mindset. Okay, so... This mindset, um, if you have a fixed mindset, you believe that intelligence character, and creativity are traits that are fixed and they cannot be changed at all. Success is dependent on inherited intelligence. So that is in intelligence that you're born with. And talent alone creates success, nothing else. Effort plays a very little role in success. So if you have a fixed mindset, this is what you will believe. It's like a cement block. So if you can see there's a cement block at the back, because having a fixed mindset is very similar to being very fixed in your thoughts and not being able to change. However, when you have a growth mindset, it's like a tree. It's forever growing. Here, you believe that intelligence is only the beginning. Mistakes are an opportunity for us to grow and learn. 
and abilities and skills can be developed through dedication and hard work. And here there'll be a love for learning and resilience. So people who have a fixed mindset, they believe, you know, we're born with the talent. If we don't have it at birth, we cannot develop it. But people with a growth mindset believe that, you know what, maybe I'm born with this much capability in this area, but if I put effort, if I try, if I persevere, I can get better. If I make mistakes, I will learn and I will grow. There'll be new connections formed. And the more I practice, those connections will only get stronger and stronger. So that's the big difference between having a fixed mindset and having a growth mindset. Um, I think we have a, okay, that was Abhijit. All right. So um, we have two types of growth mindset beliefs that I think you skipped a slide. Yeah. So fixed mindset people focus on results and looking good. Whereas people with a growth mindset, they focus on learning and improving. So now there are some mindset myths. You'll wonder, is, you know, is all uh, mindset growth or all fixed? And what is the role of, of innate in talent? Just like how Abhijit asked. So we can have growth mindset in some areas and we can have fixed mindset in other areas. And this can change from area to area and even from time to time. So at one point in your life, you may have a growth mindset about something. Tomorrow that may change and you may start to have a fixed mindset in that area. So there's no definite rule. It can change from time to time. And often when we talk about growth mindset, a question that comes up is what is the role of innate talent as we talk about this fixed and growth mindset? We're not denying the role of innate talent, but mindset determines where you take that. So if we think of Michael Phelps, for example, He's an Olympic level swimmer and he did have an advantage um, over all his competitors because of his genetics and his body structure, but he still had to practice. He used to be in the pool daily at 4 a.m., but his body structure and his genetics did give him that extra advantage over the others. However, we have to think about what would have happened had he not practiced at all. Would he still have all his gold medals? Maybe, maybe not. But it's the combination that's been key for him and for others. So Abhijit, I hope that answers um, your question now. And yes, you're right. Eight hours every day led to eight gold medals in Beijing. Absolutely true. I hope this has answered your question though, Abhijit. But if you still um, have any questions regarding this, uh, please do let me know. Um, Deva, would you like to move ahead in the slide? So we've covered this. Yeah. So now we're going to talk um, about mindset in response to mistake, effort, challenges, and feedback. So for the purpose of today, we're going to exaggerate and think in extremes. Most of us fall somewhere in the middle of the spectrum from fixed mindset to growth mindset in different areas. And not only can we have a growth mindset or fixed mindset in different areas, but we can also vary in how we respond to different things. So they, they, uh, based on your mindset, how you respond to mistakes, efforts, challenges, feedback is going to be very different. And we'll be going through an exercise to understand what all the characteristics of growth mindset and fixed mindset are. So we'll start with our favorite one, mistakes. So for this, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take a minute to think to yourself, what is your inner monologue when you make a mistake? How do you think people are viewing you when you're making that mistake? And what do you think of people when they make a mistake? So if you'd like to take one minute just to reflect on this for yourself, um, as it'll help when we move ahead in, in the presentation. <laughs>
All right. So I hope everyone has gotten a chance um, to think about these questions. And we'll definitely come back to this. Zaba, do you want to move ahead? Lovely. Um, so for those who joined us late, if you can get a sheet of paper and a pencil right now, that would be great because we're about to do a growth mindset activity that you can also replicate um, in your classrooms and with your students. And it's really a wonderful activity. So I will encourage you to get that paper and pencil. Um, it's truly an activity that changed my, my mindset for sure. Once you've got your paper and pencil and are ready, could you put a virtual thumbs up so that we know? Thank you, Aruna. Thank you, Krishna Kant. Oh, Krishna Kant, you're here. Yeah. Oh, Aida's here too, and she has her paper as well. Sandhya has also got her paper and pen. Oh, pencil. lovely. And Jasmine and Suhani also have got their paper and pencil. Okay. We can wait for two or three more people to get a paper and pencil and then we can move. Oh, even Anju has got her. Oh, Abhijit already had his. Sorry, Abhijit, it's very hard for me to keep track. All right, so um, we'll move ahead in the interest of time. So on this piece of paper, even I've got mine here, um, at the center over here, I'd like you to write down what you think has been your biggest mistake so far. So let's take a minute and do that. And then I'll tell you the next steps ahead. And you don't need to show this to anybody. So don't worry, write what makes you comfortable. Um, you can be as honest as you'd like. You don't need to show this to us. Again, once you're done, you can let us know by putting um, a virtual thumbs up, or even if you want to unmute and say, hey, I'm done, that works too. Vita's done, lovely. Thank you, Vita. And Shu and Abhishek are done. Oh, lovely. Even Krishna can't this. I have done. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Bhavna. Oh, we have a lot of people in chat who also said they're done and ready. Awesome. So now we can go on to my favorite part of this activity. All right. Oh, Pramila can't think of any big mistake. Even a small mistake will do, Pramila. It doesn't have to be so big. Any, any kind of mistake you, you've made that you'd like to put on your sheet? I'll give 30 seconds more so that Pramila can join us in the activity. Ankit is also done. I think Pramila's done. Pramila's done. All right. So, Zeba, let's move to the next slide. Okay, now I want you to crush this paper. Crush it with everything you have. And keep crushing till it becomes really, really small, like mine. Keep crushing. And now, you can open up this crushed piece of paper. Zeba, would you like to move to the next slide? So open up your crushed piece of paper just like mine. 
and everywhere you see these lines, you can use your pencil and shade the lines in. So I'll start shading mine and show you. So if you can see everywhere, there's like a, a little line formed, a little folding. I'm using my pencil to make it a little darker so that I can see it clearly. So what this is telling us is that this mistake, which you consider to be your biggest mistake, when you made it, your brain formed so many connections. All these lines on the sheet are the different connections that your brain formed just because of this one mistake. So you made one mistake and so many connections got created. Your brain grew this much just by that one mistake. That tells us that that mistake led to so much learning. That is it even worth calling it a mistake at this point because we learned so much from it. And like you can see on the screen, these are all the connections that have been formed just because you made that one mistake. You learned so much and your brain grew so much more. So this is a wonderful activity that you can also do with your students in class if you'd like. And I'll also share more about that as we go ahead. I um, just want to check, is my voice okay for everybody? Because I know it tends to be very low. Yes? Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up, which tells me it's, it's good to go. All right. <laughs> so now knowing this, what will your new inner monologue be? when you make a mistake. Why don't you take 30 seconds to think about that? Suhani says it's interesting. Suhani, it's very interesting. This is my favorite activity. All right, Deva, should we move on? Yeah. Rana said I learned something new. Oh, and that Give me that new. So, so when you know. your brain just grew, you learned something new, you formed new connections. Hopefully, they'll strengthen by the end of this presentation. Can I go to the next one? Yes. Sorry, Kev, I don't see the slide as having changed. Ah, yes, yes. All right. So even monkeys fall from trees. So what this means that even the most skilled people can make a mistake in something they should be a master of, or to put it simply, anyone can make a mistake. Okay, so how would you respond when you make a mistake if you have a growth mindset? So if you have a growth mindset, you see this as a learning moment. You say, you know what, I made a mistake, but now I can learn from it. Whereas, if you have a mistake, you're going to take these mistakes and you're going to become totally distracted. Uh, yeah. People with a growth mindset. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ruchi. People with a growth mindset see making mistakes as stairs that lead towards success. But people with a fixed mindset will start blaming external factors. So they might say, you know what, I didn't do well on this test because the way the professor phrased the question only was wrong. So they'll start to find excuses and blame others. They won't try to see how can they learn from this? How can they work harder? Where, you know, did they not study enough? Where did they not understand the portion? Where can they work on that? And next time do even better. They won't see it as that because they have a fixed mindset they'll start to blame others for what is happening. But those with a growth mindset will try to understand, you know what, what happened? Where did I go wrong? 
what can I change next time? How can I change my approach? So that's the difference between having a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. We respond to mistakes very differently. Um, now we'll take a movement break because I'm sure you're all really tired of sitting. Um, please take one minute. You can use the washroom. You can drink some water, take a walk. And when you come back, we'll continue to talk about um, growth mindset in terms of effort, challenges, and feedback. And we'll also take questions, but please do take one minute. We'll also put on a timer. Once the timer is done, you can join us back. All right. Um, I hope everyone's back with us and everyone had a good break. Um, any questions before I move ahead with effort? If you'd like to put it in chat, you can. And also you can unmute and share totally um, both work for us. I think at this point, we don't have any questions, right, Baba? So we'll move yes, ahead. Sir. Yeah. All right. So we'll move ahead and we'll talk about effort. So on your screen now, you should see a comic strip. Lovely. So it's a Calvin and Hobbes comic strip. Um, so here, um, I'll read it for you. Hobbes and I had a frank exchange of ideas. What happened to you? What are you doing? Homework? I wasn't sure I understood this chapter. So I reviewed my notes from the last chapter and now I'm rereading this. You do all that work? Well, now I understand it. Huh? I used to think you were smart. So what this is telling us is that even people who we think are smart who do really well on tests, who do really well in different areas, maybe in sports, they are putting in a lot of effort to do that. So it's not just that they're just good at something and they don't put any effort or any work into it. They're also putting in some work. They're putting in some hours to study. They're putting in some hours to practice. So we always have to put in some amount of effort. So if you have a growth mindset, you'll respond to this by giving 200% and seeking help. You'll persevere and you'll stretch yourself. But if you have a fixed mindset, you're going to be very reluctant to put in effort. You'll believe that talent and intelligence are limited. So why put in the effort? So now we come to this idea of 10,000 hours of practice. We've all heard about Sachin Tendulkar and the Beatles and their success. But do we actually know what happened behind the scenes that helped them achieve it? We know that the Beatles, before they were discovered and signed by a label, played in every bar, club, or pub, any place that let them play together as a band. So they played over 12,000 concerts together. That's right. Before they were discovered, they played 12,000 concerts. Most bands don't get to play 12,000 concerts together their entire career. So that means they put in a lot of effort. Sachin Tendulkar, who's a legend, 
we also know that when he was starting his career his coach used to take him from match to match to the point where he was playing in four matches daily across mumbai they would travel back and forth to matches that's how sachin tendulkar got the practice that allowed him to reach where he is today so we always have to put in those hours of practice you have to put in that effort nobody um can do this just based on their talent even if we look at some uh, you know a group like the beatles who are so so well known they had to put in so much effort to reach where they are today even sachin tendulkar playing four matches daily that's a lot that means he was on the field for many many hours a day and it's that um that amount of practice that got him to where he is today so yes he may have had the talent when he was born he may have had some ad- he may have had some advantages because of his genetics but he also put in a lot of effort and that's what got him to where he is today so that effort is very very important so we've talked about how we would respond to mistakes and effort now we'll talk about challenges we look at a study um and this uh study showed us how children responded to challenges so they had a fifth grade class and it was divided into two groups based on whether they had a fixed mindset or a growth mindset now all these kids were given puzzles to solve and these puzzles kept getting tougher as they kept going so surprisingly the fifth graders with a fixed mindset didn't show the same amount of enthusiasm and excitement while solving the tougher puzzles as the children with a growth mindset on the other hand the children with a growth mindset enjoyed the challenging puzzles a lot more on the way out the children were asked whether they would like to keep the puzzles the researchers found a striking difference in their responses so the children with a fixed mindset responded by saying you can keep them i already have them and the children with the growth mindset responded by saying could you write down the names of the puzzles for me i'd like my parents to buy them for me so this study highlights how children with a fixed mindset and those with a growth mindset feel and respond very differently to challenges so how we respond to challenges again depends on our mindset so if you have a growth mindset you're going to embrace these challenges you're going to take them on and say i'm going to deal with it you're going to persevere you're going to keep going even if it gets hard you'll keep trying you will adapt and you'll be optimistic about what's happening but if you have a fixed mindset you'll become fearful and you'll avoid it you're going to give up delegate to others and again blame other people for not being able to complete the challenge so even nasa they value setbacks and failure so much that they reject people with histories of only success and instead hire people who had significant failures and bounce back from them why do you think nasa might be doing this why are they only hiring people who have had setbacks any thoughts about this <clears throat> anybody oh krishna kant has a hand raised yes krishna kant on the work culture i mean the atmosphere in which they work is basically on trial and error okay uh, so that is when you say work is based on trial and error. yes what else? sorry krishna kant i cut you off please go ahead like so they need that persistent effort to go on on to be that's true they need that persistent effort to go on your right definitely abhijit uh, is yeah abhijit says because nasa doesn't guarantee 100% success results we have yes. just need who said those people who would be having growth mindset so the higher people who have growth mindset would you like me to read all of them together or would you like to respond to some uh, so okay 
So um, Abhijit, like you said, NASA doesn't guarantee 100% success results. So you're right. If you're working for NASA, you're going to experience um, challenges every day. And if you're not used to experiencing challenges, if you're not used to responding to those challenges, you'll not be able to work there. So definitely you're right, because it doesn't guarantee a 100% success result. Jasmine says those people would be having growth mindset. That's great. I'm so glad that they have a growth mindset. Um, Abhijit also says people who never fail won't be able to tackle failure. You're absolutely right. And Aruna says that resilience is a key skill for completing tasks and success. That's definitely true. And NASA definitely does value that. So if you're working at NASA, you're experiencing failure hurdles on a daily basis. So NASA wants people who know how to persevere through all the challenges that they may encounter because trust me, there are going to be a lot of them. I think that's all we have in the chat, right, Sama? All right, so we've talked about mistakes. We've talked about effort. We've talked about challenges. <clears throat> now we'll talk about feedback. <clears throat> so the power of feedback. So I want you to notice um, there are four sketches on the screen. So both the sketches of the man were created by one person and both the sketches of the lady were created by a different person. Now, how long do you think it took that person to go from the sketch on the left to the sketch on the right? Because keep in mind that the two images of the man you see on the screen, the same person has drawn it. But how long do you think it took him to go from that first picture to this second picture? Any thoughts? If you had to give like a rough number of days, how many days would you say it took him to make this progress? Six months. Okay, Abhijit is saying at least six months. All right. It depends on the level of practice. I mean, if someone is practicing every day, I would guess that it is even uh, possible in a month yeah. if you are studying. And if you are practicing less often, um, sometimes it takes years also. Even after, sometimes even after practice, it may take Years, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. One, six months, years. All right. Anything else? Pramila says years, maybe. Yeah. And Amishi said yes. The frequency of practice matters. All right. Okay. Anju says years. Okay. So guys, it took only five days. They went from the picture on the left to the picture on the right in five days. I'll tell you a little more about how that. Okay, happens. there is someone who says even two days. Even two days. Okay, awesome. You have an uh, amazing good mindset. So this took them five days to do. And um, actually it was done by Betty Edwards, <clears throat> who she's an artist and a teacher. And you know, drawing is something I think we often assume um, it's a skill to be innate, but she's actually shown us that if we put in effort, and we get the right kind of feedback, we can improve extremely fast. So what she did was when she was giving her students feedback, um, she made sure that she was giving them feedback based on the process, so not on the outcome. So what they could change, what they needed to work on, that's what she was talking to them more about rather than a final piece. And she was very specific in her feedback. So she was telling them specific things that needed to be changed rather than giving them generalized feedback. So when we want um, you know, our students to kind of make changes in what they're doing, the feedback we need to give them has to be very specific and very targeted. And I'll explain more about that in the next slide. Uh, Daya, Pramila says, was somebody there to guide them? So the answer to that is what you just said. Yes, or somebody giving them specific feedback to guide. Yes, so it was Betty Edwards, who's an artist, um, and she's a teacher. You can actually uh, read up more about her. It, it's a quite an interesting study, but it was only her, and it was only feedback. So she was giving very targeted and very specific feedback, which is what helped bring about this change. And we'll also walk you through what that specific and targeted feedback should look like. So when you have a growth mindset, you're proactively seeking feedback. You're always asking, what can I do to get better? What can I do to change? You're always seeing situations as learning opportunities. But if you have a fixed mindset, 
you don't find feedback to be helpful. You become defensive and you take it very personally. But, so there was another study done with fourth graders and these students were again divided into two groups based on whether they had a fixed or a growth mindset. So each fourth grader wore this fancy helmet that measures brain activity. And what these kids had to do was to sit in front of a computer and answer the question that was flashed on the screen. Then the screen would first flash to say if the response was correct or incorrect. And then if it was incorrect, there was a second flash that showed you how to answer the question correctly. So first, the screen would flash if you got the answer right or wrong. If you got it wrong, there would be a second flash to tell you how to solve it correctly. So what the researchers found was that for the students with a fixed mindset, they had a stronger brain wave when right or wrong was flashed on the screen. Whereas for the students who had a growth mindset, there was a stronger wave when that solution or the correct answer, how to get that correct answer was being flashed on the screen. So for the kids with a growth mindset, what was more important was not if they got the question right or wrong, but they were more interested in, if I got it wrong, how do I answer it correctly? And for the kids with a fixed mindset, they only cared about uh, or there was more brain activity when they were being told if they did something correct or incorrect. So they were only interested in the outcome. Did I get it right or did I get it wrong? Beyond that, they were not interested. But the students with a growth mindset, they wanted to focus on, okay, if I've gotten it wrong, how do I get it right? So this study highlights to us how children with a fixed or growth mindset really respond very differently to mistakes. And so now we'll watch a short video um, and this talks about, you know, growth mindset, the message, the right kind of praise. So how to use praise um, effectively. Our intuition is often to praise students for being smart. Our intuition is often to praise students for being smart. This sends the wrong message. When students later encounter a setback, they conclude, if my past success made me smart, my current struggle makes me dumb. Instead, praise students when they work hard to accomplish a difficult task. This implies that you value hard work and that hard work is the cause of success. A study with fifth graders shows the striking impact of different types of praise. Researchers asked students to complete a set of moderately challenging problems. Then, the researchers told all students that they did well. They were all told, wow, that's a really good score. For one third of students, the feedback stopped there. For another third of students, they were given intelligence praise. In addition to, wow, that's a really good score, they were also told, you must be smart at this. And another third were given effort praise. In addition to, wow, that's a really good score, they were told, you must have tried really hard. After students received feedback for their high scores, then they were all given a more challenging set of problems. The praise that students heard had a significant impact on students' motivation, but that's not all. After students experienced the challenging set of problems, they were given a final set of problems, equal in difficulty to the first set. Students who just heard, wow, that's a really good score, didn't see a difference in their performance on the first set of problems and the last set. That's not surprising since they were equal in difficulty. What's interesting is how the praise impacted students. Students who heard effort praise, who were told, you must have tried really hard, did better on the final set of problems. And what's most surprising is that students who were given intelligence praise, who were told, you must be smart at this, actually did worse. Just one line of praise significantly impacted students' performance. So what this is telling us is that, you know, when you give intelligence praise to say, oh, you must be really smart, you can do this, 
that doesn't tell somebody what they need to work on it doesn't tell them you know okay this is where you made a mistake this is what you need to focus on it doesn't give them any information on how to improve but when you give effort praise you're telling that person okay you did this right you studied for 10 hours that was good or you answered this two mark question by giving me two points that's what i was looking for but maybe you can work on your sentence structure so you have to give very um you know like targeted praise to tell that student exactly what it is that you want them to do and praise them for putting in that effort don't focus on the outcome or the results but praise the fact that they put in effort and be specific about what kind of effort it is that they put in so anju has posted in the chat saying pass is the strategy to give uh, feedback make it personal make it authentic make it specific and spontaneous i think that's lovely um and definitely that would work very well so you have to decide what kind of message you want to send are you sending a message that you have permanent traits and i'm judging you that's your intelligent praise oh sorry rakesh i'll keep my voice louder sorry um or do you want to give the message that you are a developing person and i'm interested in your development that is when you give effort praise so you need to think about what message it is that you want to send <clears throat> so now we look at <clears throat> a study that was done which talks about the power of feedback um you'll see a barometer on your screen that's hattie's barometer and it's very famous so what this does is that it shows us that feedback is amongst the most powerful influences on achievement and it lies at 0.73 so we often assume that this skill should be innate but this is showing us that if we put effort and we give really good feedback we can actually improve really fast so feedback actually has a very strong um effect on what actually ends up happening <clears throat> so using the right kind of praise one make sure you're using growth mindset language so there should be no judgments or sending the wrong message be specific stay away from labels do not use words like you're so smart you're a smart girl you're a smart boy that doesn't tell anybody what they're doing right and what they need to work on and what's working for them praise their effort and not just the result you want to praise that process they may not get it right but they may have put a lot into that so we want to praise them for that we want to praise someone for trying for giving their best and never compare somebody's performance to that of someone else compare somebody's performance to their own past performance we look at two examples to help make this a little more clear for you all and here i'm going to have to ask you to excuse my hindi because i may not be able to pronounce one of the words on this slide but i will try so a child answers a question um incorrectly in history class and his peers start laughing and calling him buddu the teacher says a hey, kharira think before you answer so here do you think this person is using growth mindset language no so sandhya says he's not using growth mindset language and she's absolutely right even anju saying the same thing even bhagna saying the same thing he's not using growth mindset language so instead he could have said something like i like that you tried and gave it some thought but let us think a little bit more about this so here you've acknowledged that they've put in effort they've tried they've given their best they may not have got it right okay let's try again like manju saying you can even say good try yes praise the effort that they've put in they've tried so let's praise that so use growth mindset language try to stay away from any kind of labels try to stay away from any kind of judgments or sending the wrong message to anybody Yeah, yeah. Manju also said that we scaffold and give prompts. Definitely, for sure. All right. So in math class, a teacher is giving feedback to a student after he answers the question correctly in a whole group. 
So the teacher says, you got it. I told you, you're smart. What's wrong with this phrase? What are they using that's not okay? We must appreciate the small efforts of our students also, definitely. In this sentence though, <clears throat> what do you think this person is using that they shouldn't be? <clears throat> so they use- Somehow she is also leveling the child. You're smart, you're not smart, you're smart. You're smart. You're smart. <laughs> there was a lot of background. Andrew so, says he's labeling. Andrew, you're absolutely right. He's labeling. He's using the word smart, which is a label. And we want to stay away from that. Because what happens is if I tell you you're smart and tomorrow you get a question wrong, You'll say, but I'm supposed to be smart. How did I get this wrong? You start to question yourself. So we need to, there is the effort that you put in versus putting a label on you because that label doesn't help. So how could they have <clears throat> phrased this differently? If you were giving feedback, what would you have said instead to this student? Anybody wants to give it a try? Anyone? <clears throat> I think that people are taking too much to think how to frame it. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Uh, do you want to share an example? Mm -hmm. I can share an example. Okay. Oh, we have one. Ma'am, I think the whole group should be praised. Okay. So in a math class, teacher is giving feedback to a student after he answers the question correctly in a whole group. Okay. <clears throat> so praising the whole group at this point um, may not really help because we want to give that one student specific feedback since they responded um, appropriately. Uh, but yes, we should um, give them that feedback in front of in front of others. Um, so aren't you saying we can say, oh, good. I saw you're constantly giving your whole, your whole yearly effort. And Aruna is saying you got it right. You recalled the steps in the right order and checked your work before submitting. These two phrases are very specific. Um, especially Aruna's phrase, it actually tells the child, okay, what you did um, that got you to where you were. So they know what to replicate next time to ensure that they get it right. Uh, Manju, I saw that you had a hand raised. Would you like to share something? Yes, ma'am. Usually mm -hmm. what we do in my class is that uh, I don't directly say if it's the right answer or uh, wrong. Instead, I ask everyone to try. I prompt them, like, uh, like others also try give their answers, whether right or wrong. And then at last, there will be just, uh, it's not a very big price because others shouldn't be, uh, you know, feeling bad bec uh, just because we are pricing more to the uh, one person, one student in the class. So I take care not, not to be like that. So the same, like uh, how you were explaining right, uh, right now, that uh, good effort just a good effort, a, a good amount of uh, time you're giving to this, uh, that's it now. All right, thank you, Manju. Um, Pramila says, you got it. You've understood the process very good. 
So I think you've all got the idea. We need to give um, effort-specific praise rather than giving outcome-specific praise and stay away from those labels. So make sure you're always using growth mindset language. You're always being specific, praising the effort, not just the results, and comparing somebody's performance to their own past performance versus comparing it to that of someone else. <clears throat> So we've spoken about um, growth mindset, fixed mindset, and how it impacts uh, mistakes, challenges, feedback, and effort. So at this point, we've talked about the why, we've talked about the what, and in the next session, next section, sorry, we're going to talk about the how. So how can you bring this growth mindset into your practice? Um, before we do that, um, are there any questions at this point? Um, that you all have before we move ahead. So we'll take a one minute break. Um, you can do anything you like in this one minute if you need to return a phone call, need to drink some water, and then we move to the last section for today. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> awesome. Daya, Mandeep in chat said there's answering as well as questioning techniques. Uh, Mandeep, would you like to uh, elaborate a little for them? I'm a little confused. Are you asking us if there are um, answering as well as questioning techniques or you're sharing that? Uh, uh, hello. Uh, no. Hi. Uh, I'm Dr. Mandeep from uh, Khalsa College of Education, Amritsar. Yes. Uh, I'm just uh, telling uh, while praising the, we can't praise each and every student because there's a general tendency uh, on the part of students that some students, they have the mentality of teasing the teacher. And they always ask the questions, uh, what is, uh, ma'am, please repeat the question, please repeat the answer. So if we always go uh, with this, then that will have a negative effect on whole the class as well as on the teacher. So we must know what, is, what are the techniques of accepting the answers, uh, correct, incorrect, complete, incomplete, incomplete, correct, in complete uh, and totally incorrect and in the similar way there are uh, uh, questioning techniques which a teacher must know uh, while uh, questioning and getting the answer it all the, the praise uh, i all uh, yes you are rightly saying that uh, praise should be in the public and the punishment should be in the private this is very very important Sorry, Mandeep, no punishment. No, no punishment. punishment. Actually, Mandeep, you joined a little bit uh, late. We have been uh, talking. I, 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 yeah. I'm not talking about the punishment. I'm just uh, in the. No. I'm talking. Yes, about yes. Uh, uh, Mandeep, we had uh, discussed a few concepts uh, before you had joined, and it was about, you know, why uh, the effort needs to be praised uh, rather than the intelligence of the student. So we yeah, were talking about that. 
yeah 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 and uh, like emotional intelligence today is the in the present scenario it's very important rather than the intelligence so this emotional intelligence plays very important role while you uh, praise someone or say something uh, to the student so uh, this is very important yes definitely i, I think we have to um, be mindful of you know how we're giving that praise because we don't want to discourage our students also and and i agree with what you're saying you know we do have to give feedback to say you know how many did you get right what was incomplete what was yeah. correct so one way i would do it um and actually i i i would recommend this ted talk to you also i watched this ted talk about rita pearson who is an educator herself and she said you know when her students would do their tests instead of saying got 5 out of 10 she would put plus 5 because what that meant was you didn't get 5 out of 10 questions right and five wrong what she's saying is plus five you got five right so she's trying to motivate them to say this is what you got right this is what you did well you keep going with that so that's a nice way to present it to our students it tells them how many they got right but at least we're focusing on what they did right versus comparing it to what they did wrong so instead of saying five out of 10 i would say plus five that shows them what they did correctly So it's a different way to grade the paper. Any other questions before we move into the how? <laughs> All right. So we've spoken about our why. We've spoken about our what. Now we go to the how. How can we build a mindset for learning in our own schools? So I'll show you a few examples of how you can do this. so first again focus on learning do not focus on the results the process is what's important the outcome is secondary reinforce with visuals and explicitly teach your students about mindset compare to their own past performance versus that of others and use growth mindset language so be specific and stay away from labels focus on effort strategies and your process so we can reinforce with visuals i'll take you through a few visuals that we use in our classrooms we stick this up around the class to remind our students of these growth mindset concepts and sometimes you know if a child we see is really struggling with growth mindset we might even stick this on their desk to remind them um zeba can you click on the abc one that's a really nice one to show <clears throat> is it possible to zoom in lovely so this is a poster that talks about my like, growth mindset self talk so there's um one for every letter of the alphabet so like a says attitude and effort determine how much i learn b i can be brave and step out of my comfort zone c challenges help me grow so these are all growth mindset concepts that will continue to remind your students to focus um on that learning on that making mistakes on that challenging themselves putting in effort continue going this is a really nice visual to put up in your classes um there are two more that i wanted to show you so this one is my favorite um it says i can't do that yet and i find this to be very powerful because what it's saying is that i may not be able to do it today i may not be able to do it tomorrow but i'll be able to do it one day so that word get says i can't do it now but maybe i will in the future so we're not totally saying hey, i can't do that and closing the door on it there's a potential that it could open up at some point and that in itself is growth mindset <clears throat> another nice one is the only person you need to compare yourself with is who you were yesterday so look at who you were yesterday compare that to who you are today and then compare that to who you will be tomorrow so that again is that whole idea of growth mindset and comparing you know your own past performance rather than comparing yourself to others so these are some visuals you can use in your classrooms and in the chat i see manju has said that <clears throat> the praise we use should motivate at the same time we should be careful to not give space for arrogance to grow up definitely you're right 
we want to make sure that our students don't become arrogant. So we need to give them um, that fine balance. And I think if you follow the steps that we outline, that will ensure that you stay within, um, within that balance. So definitely reinforce with visuals. Um, other things you can do is you can explicitly teach to create a culture where we're all practicing growth mindset. So the way we interact with our students <clears throat> is us modeling how our students should interact with each other. And we need to remember that, you know, student-student interactions are far more powerful than student-teacher interactions. So be mindful of that. Um, read alouds are also really nice. We'll be showing you one. So if you want to teach growth mindset, um, the fantastic elastic brain is a lovely one. And even the beautiful oops is a beautiful one to show your students. And we're going to be showing you that. You can also do activities. So the crumpled paper activity that I did with you all, having you write your biggest mistake, scrunching it up, opening it, and seeing how many connections form. You can do that with your students also to show them that, you know, even though you made this big mistake, these are how many connections that form after that mistake. So we've done this with our kids in class. And you can also do it with your students as well. I think students of any age, actually, um, it can be done with, of course, the examples that they give will, will vary, but you can definitely replicate this. And you, there's also a website called Mindset Kit. Um, this has a lot of different activities. So you can go on that and find them as well. And finally, teachers giving feedback. <clears throat> Ensuring that we're being specific. Focusing on process and the strategies will help you greatly. Now you want me to sh stop sharing screen, you want to play the video? I think Ruchi wants to share something. Ruchi, no, no, no. Uh, I was just saying sorry, I muted that person. Oh, okay. I'll share the video, the beautiful oops video, just a minute. Okay. Uh, please let me know if you can't hear. Beautiful oops by Barney Salzberg. Now we can't hear. Now we can't hear, sorry. We were hearing a minute before. Oh, sorry, one second. I'll start it again. You'll have to start re restart. Yeah, we can hear this. Oops. A torn piece of paper is just the beginning. Every spill has lots. And paper It's something to celebrate. A little drip of paint lets your imagination run wild. A scrap of paper can be fun to play with. A smudge and a smear can make magic appear. A stain has potential if you play with its shape.
told in your paper? Are worth exploring. When you think you have made a mistake, but as an opportunity to make something beautiful. Hope you all <clears throat> liked that video. Um, it's one that we really, uh, really, really love. We use it with all our kids, especially our younger kids. Because um, I think what, even for adults, I think for me, the first time um, I saw it also, it, it just reinforces that idea, right? You know, even these small little things that we make mistakes, we don't realize how, how beautiful they can be turned into something. Um, and you can find this uh, beautiful oops read aloud on YouTube, but there's also a physical book. So if you want to get that, if you're working with young kids, you might want to get that physical book in your classroom so you can pass it around and they can actually see um, the different shapes and, you know, interact with the, the different papers and, and things like that. It, it's really a nice one to have around. Even the fantastic elastic brain is really nice. It's just longer, but it, it's also quite, quite powerful. <clears throat> so with that, um, we have come to the Is this online ho to Hamesha or? Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, with that, we have come to the end of our session today. Um, as a recap, we spoke about the why. We said that, you know, the brain is plastic and talent can be developed. If you put in growth, if, if you want growth, then you have to put in effort and hard work and challenges and mistakes promote learning. We need to praise effort and focus on that learning. Have process and learning oriented goals and not performance oriented goals. So talent is only a starting point but effort will realize one's full potential. So be mindful of the messages that we're sending our students about success and failure, because mindset drives both our thoughts and our actions. And there are two types of mindset. There's the fixed mindset, and there's that growth mindset that we spoke about. So fixed mindset believes that intelligence and talent are fixed at birth. Whereas growth mindset is saying, intelligence and talent can grow and they can develop and how do we do that through the power of yet saying maybe i can't do it today but one day i will do it use growth mindset language reinforce with those visuals in your classroom make sure they're up where everybody can see them and they're constantly accessible even with adults and explicitly teach growth mindset so use the paper crumpling activity use these read alouds go on the website. I know someone asked for the website and I see that Zeb has put it in the chat. So go on that website. There are lots of different activities for different age groups that you can go through. Um, unfortunately, because of time, I can't take you through so many. Um, but I have put my email address and Zeb has up. Um, I think it's the last slide, Zeba, in case they'd like to reach out to us. You can definitely send us an email if you're looking for um, more, you know, contextualized um, examples of how to uh, bring this into your space, do shoot us an email and we'll definitely be able to get back to you. Um, Ruchi, do we have time for questions? Have I overshot the time? Uh, actually, we have uh, finished our time, but if there are any short questions, please do let us know right here. And uh, you can also continue discussion on Telegram group. That is what we have it for. Uh, there, you can also join that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Any any quick questions you have? Anybody has a quick question? Uh, 
Sorry, Satish, you joined very late. Okay. We have finished our uh, session. Uh, and you can see the recording on the YouTube whenever we upload it. And uh, after that, if you want to continue the discussion, we can do that on our School Synergy Teacher Forum Telegram group. I would just uh, like to invite everyone to please fill up the feedback form. I have uh, shared the feedback form link on the chat. I'll share it again. Yeah, I request all of you to please fill it up. And, uh, you know, I hope we will be able to continue further in the uh, Telegram group. I really want to thank Daya, both Daya and Zeba for uh, taking us through this, you know, uh, idea of mindset for learning, sharing us different, um, uh, sharing with us different mindsets, and uh, uh, talking about, you know, what, why, and how of this mindset of learning. And I'm sure uh, we are all enriched with so many examples of how we can, you know, the uh, make our mistakes make use of our mistakes into uh, uh, so making it into something creative and something beautiful, uh, just like your um, uh, My Beautiful Oops, right? I really love that idea that uh, it's a very beautiful book and I'm sure it's for uh, children and adults alike. Can be, everybody would love that book. Definitely everybody would. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Ruchi, for inviting Zeba and I. It, it was lovely being here today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I can't share the feedback form on mail. I have shared it on the chat. If uh, you can fill it up, it would be really great. You just have to click on this feedback form. <laughs> okay. So thank you all. Uh, unless there are something, uh, some questions you, uh, anyone want to ask? I don't think so. Okay, so uh, once again, uh, thank you so much, Daya and Zeba. We'll end the call here itself. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am.